what we're doing today is I'm gonna review all the stuff that I've learned about air intakes since this project started a few months ago. Let's go. So here is our piston, and then here is our long runner designed for low RPM, mid RPM performance. When you pull this slow, representing a low RPM, it doesn't, it doesn't take too much force to bring this piston up and it draws a nice full reservoir of fluid. But see what happens when we pull it really hard. If we're at high RPM, this piston needs to move down really fast. And at that point, it takes so much energy to bring that same amount of fluid in. I had to pull so much harder with my arm. Force that out. Now with a super short runner, I can draw a full volume of fluid slowly, and I can easily draw it quickly too. So what, what benefit does that restriction even offer? <laughs> that sounded funny. How can more work and more restriction equate to better performance? But before I give the answer to that question and go more into detail about why a long runner does what it does, I wanna talk about Helmholtz resonance. It's something that a lot of you guys have brought up to me in the comments on the videos, and it's a concept I was sort of familiar with, but I started researching the subject a lot deeper, and I watched a video on it by a guy by the name of Scott Hatch, who has a lesser known YouTube channel. I'm gonna link it down in the video's description because he has some great educational content that you guys should check out if you wanna delve deeper into this whole air intake engine mechanics topic like I did. But I'm going to summarize the stuff that I learned from him because he's kind of wrapped it all together for me and combine it with all the other stuff that I've learned along the way through this process. So you have the concept, uh, this guy discovered that every volume of fluid has a resonant frequency and when you apply his principles to an air intake system, it takes into account the um, action of the valve slapping shut against the valve seat in the head. This creates a pressure wave that runs up the runner and then it reflects back, and then it reflects back off of the valve, back off of the, the plenum, back off of the valve. So the length of your runner determines how long it takes for that pressure wave to reflect and come back to the valve. So. Here is, I'm just gonna draw a rectangle. Here is your, your valve here. The pressure wave runs up. It reflects off of, this will be like a plenum volume, it reflects off of this, and then it comes back down. So if the runner is longer, it takes longer for that wave to reach the end before it can reflect back down again. That looks like a penis. I tried so hard to not draw phallic things. I, I revised this. I revised this multiple times to make it look less phallic. Okay, forget the plenum, these are just rectangles, okay? We have a nice, normal rectangle. There, looks like cell phone signal. Nothing phallic about it, okay. We have the waves going up. Obviously, this is gonna have the smallest resonant frequency, middle, longer. You get the concept. So each of these different runner links, let me just put two back up here so we have a little visualization. We have a small and, and a large. Every runner length only resonates at one RPM range and then multiples of that RPM range because of harmonics. So a shorter runner length will only resonate at high RPM ranges and a longer runner length will resonate at lower RPM ranges. And the important event that we're looking for that determines whether one of these resonant frequencies is going to generate a positive or negative result in the performance of our engine is the valve closing event. So at high RPM, there is less time between the valve closing and then the valve opening again. And at low RPM, that timing is a lot longer, obviously. So what we're trying to accomplish if we're using Helmholtz resonance to increase performance is what we're trying to achieve this pressure pulse coming towards the valve as it opens again after it has closed. So the valve closes, the pulse leaves, it reflects off of the plenum and it comes back down and it is going towards the valve when the valve goes to open for its next intake cycle. But if that pressure pulse got there too soon and now it's leaving, then you're gonna have, instead of more air being forced in by this positive pressure wave, you're gonna have less air going in because the pulse is moving away from the valve. So for every bit of performance you gain at a certain RPM range, 
through Helmholtz resonance, you lose at a different RPM range that doesn't hit that sweet spot. But the most surprising thing is I, like you, thought that Helmholtz resonance was the main contributor for determining your runner length. I thought you calculated the resonant frequency and that was the main reason why you choose a short runner or a long runner because of this, this pulsating effect that happens because of the valve closing. And that is not the case. It's not the case. This is actually a second order effect. There's something else going on that's more important than the resonant frequency of the volume. And you can use this. I mean, it's worth, it's worth checking out and doing the math and contributing you know, this effect to the overall design, but it's not the main reason. The main reason is air speed and air flow. How fast the air move is moving at this point right here and how much air you can get through this point right here, regardless of the resonant frequency, regardless of these pressure pulses. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit, and then I'm gonna come back to Helmholtz a little bit later on. So let's go back to the question that we asked earlier. How can more work contribute to more power? How can that work? Well, the answer lies in the properties of the air. It's the fact that air, unlike the ATF that I was using in the demonstration, air is compressible. So this air can be compressed in this volume by the speed of the air coming in. So if the air coming through this opening on both sides, I didn't draw an arrow over here, but it's insinuated. If the air going through this gap is moving faster than the piston is moving down, then it's going to compress the air that's already in that chamber as the piston draws more air in. And for a brief moment, right before this valve slaps shut, you have pressurized air in your chamber because of the airspeed. So if you have a very short runner, you don't have enough time for that air to gain momentum and increase airspeed as it goes through that valve gap, and you end up with one atmosphere of pressure inside your cylinder. But if the runner is long, it gains momentum as it travels all the way down its length. It's going a lot faster at this valve, and it's actually, these particles are pushing against the other particles that are in there and pushing them down into the surface of the piston because they're moving faster than the piston. What's really amazing about this whole process is how similar it is to the way a supercharger works, but with no moving parts. And you can see the similarity when you take the four stroke combustion cycle and you break it down and look at it stroke by stroke, which if you're a fan of, you can uh, show your enthusiasm for the combustion process in style by getting one of these beautiful t-shirts from my website, link down below. So of those four strokes, only one of them is generating torque. The other three cost torque. So how's torque generated? Well, it's just a combination of the efficiency of the engine, the brake specific fuel consumption, and the fuel consumption itself. If you wanna make more power, you either need your engine to be more efficient or you need to burn more fuel. And if you wanna burn more fuel, you need more air to burn the fuel with. So how does a supercharger work? It's kind of like magic. It seems counterintuitive to most people, maybe everybody, um, because it takes torque away from the engine in order to add more air into the intake, and that extra air allows more fuel to be burned, and the net result is more power, as long as your supercharger isn't too big. Now, a turbo works in a very similar way, except instead of taking torque directly off the crankshaft, you're actually increasing the restriction on the exhaust system, so it costs more torque to complete this exhaust stroke but that allows you to bring more air into the combustion chamber on your intake stroke. And the net result is you burn more fuel, you get more power. As long as the turbo is not too big and it's designed for the correct RPM range that the engine can handle. So I think you're getting the concept here that there's no such thing as a free lunch. When there's work that has to be done, whether spinning a supercharger or spinning a turbo, you have to take the energy from one of these processes in order for that work to be done to bring more air and fuel into your combustion chamber. And the long runner on the intake is no different. Even though it, there's no moving parts, it's still increasing the restriction on the intake system. A long runner is always gonna be more restrictive than a short runner, but that restriction allows the air to move faster because it can build up some momentum along its length. And because the air is moving faster than the piston, as I explained before, you can burn more fuel because you have pressurized air in here where you didn't before. And the restriction starts to get too large at high RPM because at, in the demonstration, as you noticed, if you want to pull that syringe really fast, 
it is harder to pull. If you want the work to be done quickly, then it increases the amount of work that has to be done because you're shortening the amount of time you have to do that work. So that is why at high RPM, you start to lose power with a long runner because this restriction starts to get too big for the engine to handle. So now that we know the primary reason for choosing long runners over short runners, if you want low RPM performance or mid-range RPM performance, what purpose does resonance tuning have? And in my opinion, it's not worth it to use resonance tuning to chase peak power because what's really important isn't peak power for performance. I can't think of a racing series where peak power wins over area under the curve. Area under the curve is what wins races, not peak power, average horsepower. So what I would do when considering uh, Helmholtz resonance tuning is to minimize loss rather than chase peak power because like I said before with every benefit you get from resonance there's also a drawback at a slightly different RPM either slightly above or slightly below the place where you get the the benefit. So in this little example the blue line represents the stock um, configuration the red line is uh, intake tuned to make more power at 3000 RPM based on resonance. And then the green line makes more power at, eh, not quite, this is 4000, it makes power maybe at 3500, slightly more. This isn't a perfect example because you'd never really want the engine to make power that low unless you're driving a tow truck or something. But it's just to illustrate the point that in my opinion, this green line car would be much more fun to drive than the red line car because the red line car created a dip right where the OEM uh, system started to take off. So right through here, it's gonna feel really sluggish. It's worth it to take the dip earlier on so that you can kind of just accentuate the natural um, curve that the engine wants to take based on the other parameters not having to do with intake, such as valve size, engine displacement, max RPM, all that stuff. So this is just to illustrate that Helmholtz resonance tuning is a fine tuning thing. It's not the primary concern. And in my opinion, it should be used to minimize losses rather than chase peak power. 5,000 subscribers, dude. I am, you guys are freaking awesome. So much, so much has, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little, I'm, I'm a little choked up, honestly. So much has happened as a result of your guys' engagement and your support with, throughout this project. And I just, I'm, I'm so appreciative. Like I'm really thankful to you guys for um, just being as excited as I am about this stuff. And we have, we have a partner technic competition. I may have, may have remembered me mentioning them before. I'm in partner with them in our 3D printing operation. And this is a, a motor cover that we recently made for somebody. Um, for like a Winnebago, it covers a motor that brings the bed up and down inside of the RV. And uh, he, he's selling these, we're selling these on the website in partnership with him. And uh, this is the kind of stuff we do. So if there's something that, a product idea that you have in mind that you wanna sell, um, we can go in business together. And this is the result of what we can make. And there's something else I wanna show you as well. This is a representation of uh, the size of stuff that we can make with this big printer. I decided on the intake project that I'm going to be designing engine stuff and intake stuff and exhaust stuff too my whole life because it's awesome. It's so much fun to like search for performance and stuff. And I, I kind of got a new um, picture of where I wanted to go with the project. Everything's still on track the same way, but I decided I want to make something that works and start, because this is open source. I want to release these files so you guys can print it yourself. Um, you might need a really big printer to do so. Um, and I'm, I'm going to sell this stuff too. So if you don't have a super big printer, then you can, you can buy it from me. But I want to make something that works and verify um, performance and move forward from there. I'm kind of like changing the scope of the project. So like the end result um, of, you know, all the optimizations will come as time goes on. But I wanna make, this is gonna be just a straight up long runner design that I'm gonna put on the car. We're gonna do some dyno tests. 
make sure that a long runner or see what kind of performance impact this long runner design has. There'll be no moving parts. This is just like strictly long runner, no weird short runner stuff going on. Conventional design. Um, see what kind of performance impact it has and then go from there. And at least we'll have something that you guys can make um, and we'll have verifiable data on. So thank you for your support. Uh, continue supporting the channel. Check out Technic Competition. Check out my website and I will see you in the next video.